Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to turn to God's Word, and uh, if you brought a Bible, snag it, turn with me to Matthew 6. It's the first book in the New Testament. Um, if you did not bring a Bible, there's a black Bible in the pew rack in front of you, and that Matthew 6 in that Bible is found on page 787. So we're, once again, we're, um, well, I'll give you a second to find your spot. So Matthew 6, we're going to look at verses 5 through 15 this morning. Um, and as I mentioned before, we're, we're walking through the Lord's Prayer, um, recognizing that, you know, the Lord's Prayer is, is kind of one of those traditions of the church that has so often can easily just become rote or routine to us. Um, again, we joke about it, but I think it's true that many of us, if we grew up in the church, uh, or even if we... Um, had friends in the church, we can probably recite the Lord's Prayer in our sleep or as we're thinking about something else, as we're making our grocery list, as we're driving without even really thinking about the words. And we're turning to the Lord's Prayer because Jesus taught his disciples to pray to the Father by it. Jesus, the Son of God, came down to earth to teach us, God taught us, how to pray to God. I don't, that blows my mind. That God himself, he wouldn't leave us up to just figuring it out on ourselves, but Jesus taught us how to pray to the Father. And not only is that astounding in and of itself, but just looking at each line, each word um, is mind-blowing, is very radical for the day of Jesus and is, is very revolutionary uh, to the church today, in the culture today. And so as we walk through, we, we simply have walked through that we can address God the Father as our Father, as one who loves us and knows us, that God is not just this ambiguous being out there, but he reveals himself as a Father to us who who is all-powerful, who's in heaven, who's transcendent, but yet is personal. And that's the beginning of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven blows my mind. So this week, we're turning to forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Uh, before we jump in, why don't we just read Matthew 6, 5 through 15 together. Follow along as I read. Jesus said, starting at verse 5, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep, babbling, keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. So we're going to look at uh, forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And then verses 15, 14 and 15, Jesus kind of expounds on it. Before we dive in, I just want to make this confession. I'm not that good at math. It may not surprise some of you, divinity school, Kind of the, the staple class is not math. Um, growing up, I was not all that good at math. Um, I, I got my way through high school. I got my way through college. But um, simply, math doesn't really come easy to me. The only thing I'm, I'm decently good at is, but I still cheat every once in a while, is when we're at dinner and it's time to, to calculate the tip for the waiter. And even then, um, you know, depending on 
the abundance we've had at dinner, even, even that's a little tricky. And so I think I continue to be bad at math because I cheat by having a calculator on my phone, and so I'm really curious um, to get that, that 10 or 15 or 20% tip to um, our waiter or waitress. Um, I'm bad at math, but yet I'm good at counting. What I mean by that, and, and this is made very abundantly clear um, since I was, uh, I was probably about four or five. I remember um, I was just a kid. I have two older brothers, one who's four years and, and, and seven years older than I was. Um, when I was about four or five, the most popular toy at the time was a Stretch Armstrong. Who remembers what Stretch Armstrong was? Yes. I, I, I don't think they're safe anymore. Because um, like you, you could pull him and contort him, and he he'd take back his original shape. Um, if you were really good, you contort him so much that he, his guts would kind of burst out. I'm pretty sure it's toxic. Um, but my favorite toy, when I was four or five years old, was Stretch Armstrong. Um, and I, I when I'd break one, I'd, I'd ask my dad to get me another one, and and so so on and so forth. Well, this one particular instance, um, my middle brother. He brought his friends over to the house. I was playing with my Stretch Armstrong. I was the youngest, so I was absolutely innocent. Whatever it was, I was innocent. I wasn't causing trouble. I wasn't provoking him. I was just kind of in my corner, playing with my toy all by myself. And my middle brother's best friend decided, his name's Jared, not that it matters, decided to come steal my Stretch Armstrong. They started playing with it. And lo and behold, they twisted him enough that all it got spewed out. I was devastated that day. To this day, I'm 29 now, so that's about 25 years ago. I still have animosity towards Jared for breaking my stretch Armstrong. You know, granted, like, a couple days later, my dad got me another one. But this particular instance, I still, you know, I still remember it like it was yesterday. That's when I learned that I'm actually really good at counting. And I would venture to say that those of us this morning, um, if math comes easy to you or it does not come easy to you, I would venture to say that each and every one of us this morning is pretty good at counting as well. I would say each and every one of us are pretty good at counting who has wronged us in the past, how many times that person has wronged us in the past, and how specifically that person has wronged us. No matter how long ago it was, no matter um, how much you've tried to work past it, there's, a, there's something ingrained in our humanity, in our humanness, that we just kind of hold on to these situations and we carry them with us. Failing in a way, I'm going to argue this morning, failing to forgive. We're really good at counting the wrongs done to us. When we count that against those people, that's, that's unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. And we're really good at keeping track. Who's wronged us? How many times? When? But Jesus, as he reveals in the text this morning, as he reveals throughout the Gospels, as he reveals throughout all of Scripture, that the message and ministry of Jesus, the centerpiece of the message and ministry of Jesus, is forgiveness is forgiveness. Jesus teaches us to pray, forgive us our debts, as we have forgiven our debtors, forgiveness. Even the ministry of Jesus, we see um, as he heals individuals. There's a story where there's this paralytic, and the paralytic is trying to see Jesus. He's in this house, and there's this huge crowd in this house, and this paralytic, paralytic cannot get to Jesus, and so his friends, they take the tiles off the ceiling, they lower him down, the very first thing Jesus says to that man, he wants to get healed. But the very first thing Jesus says to him is, son, your sins are forgiven. Jesus taught on forgiveness. Jesus healed by forgiveness, through forgiveness. Jesus practiced forgiveness, even on the cross. Jesus uttered these words, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. Even he put it into practice. And so this morning, I, I just want to walk through the Lord's Prayer when it comes to forgiveness. And I want to argue this idea that 
encountering the Father's mercy through the cross enables us to extend mercy to others. Encountering the Father's mercy on the cross enables us to extend mercy to others. What do I mean by that? Well, the first point I want to make is that when we turn to the prayer in verse 12, um, there is still this connection of a daily relationship with God, where we encounter him daily. What do I mean by that? Well, last week we talked about, give us today our daily bread. And it was very important that Jesus was relaying to his disciples that um, the Father loves to be the provider to us, but also that the Father loves to be the pursuer of us, that we ask that God would provide our daily needs, not our weekly needs, not our monthly needs, not our yearly needs, our daily needs, this rhythmic relationship that God desires with his children, that daily we would pray to him and ask that he would provide. But I believe here in the text, Jesus also wants us to go to God daily and ask for forgiveness. If you look very closely at verses um, 11 and 12, Jesus says, give us today our daily bread. Verse 12, and forgive us our debts. That connected, that and is so important. Give us today, today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts. Connects us to today, or and forgive us today our debts. That God continues to pursue us, and in this pursuing relationship, God, Jesus teaches us to confess and to seek the forgiveness of our sins. That we seek to confess and that Jesus would uh, forgive, or that the Father would forgive our sins. Now, we didn't do it this morning, um, but kind of up to this point I've heard, um, who was taught how to pray, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass? Who was taught how to pray, forgive us our debts, as we forgive? Who was taught how to pray, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who are sins against us? Now, interestingly, and I, just to kind of clarify, um, debts, trasp- trespasses, and sins is all correct. You could use a variety of any of them. The idea is sin. Now, we get debts. Jesus specifically says debts here, and we're going to tease that out here in a little bit. We get trespasses uh, because verses 15 and 16, um, literally the sin there is how we translate from the Greek trespasses. And then Jesus teaches his disciples to pray the Lord's Prayer in Luke. And in Luke, he says sin. Forgive us our sin. And so really, Jesus teaches all these variations, um, all these different words, but the idea, the baseline is sin. That we go to the Father and we ask him to forgive our sin daily. Now I want to pause for a moment there and I want to talk about two different confessions. Because we look in scripture and we know that there is a confession for rebirth and there is a confession for restoration. We, we confess for rebirth and, and we confess for restoration. What do I mean by that? Well, Paul says in Romans, he says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's a confession, that this saving act. When we confess Jesus as our Lord and Savior, when we decide, when we receive him, a rebirth happens in our spirit. Jesus says you can't see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. Well, how do we become born again? Paul says in Romans 10, 9, you confess with your mouth, Jesus, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. It's this rebirth. And when Jesus tells us to pray daily, forgive us our debts, um, he's not pointing to the rebirth confession. He's pointing to the restoration confession the restoration, we pray for rebirth, and then the Father uh, births us again. I I don't have to revisit that, but the second point is we pray this restoration uh, confession. John says in 1 John 1, he says, if we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. He said, let me repeat that. If we say we have fellowship with God, meaning if we proclaim to be Christians, 
if we say that we believe in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, is we, if we claim to other people that we follow Jesus, but we walk in darkness, meaning our actions do not line up with what uh, Jesus revealed Christians should act, John says, then we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So John is essentially saying, listen, you can proclaim to be a Christian, but uh, looking at your actions in your faith, your actions, uh, your disciplines, your affections, your thoughts, they reveal whether you're truly in fellowship with the, God, with the Father or not. Um, and so we could kind of think about it this way. Rebirth, the confession of rebirth, breaks the sin, the penalty and the power of sin in our lives. It breaks the penalty and the power of sin. We're reborn again. We're now citizens of heaven. Sin no longer has power or dominion on us. Uh, and the penalty of death. Paul says elsewhere in Romans, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God through Jesus is eternal life. Um, so when we confess Jesus, when we're born again, then the penalty and power of sin is broken out of our lives. However, if you are being honest like me, sin is still present in our lives. We still struggle. It's not that we proclaim Jesus as Lord and then we're, boom, we're perfect. I want to say I'm a perfect pastor, but the reality is I still sin. You can confess Jesus as Lord. You can receive him. You can be born again. You have this powerful experience where you in, in, encounter the Father's forgiveness. And yet, there still seems to be this presence, this lingering sin in your life. And what John says in 1 John 1 is you confess that regularly. You purge yourself of it regularly. You go to the Father and you say, Father, I've sinned against you regularly. Paul says elsewhere that you wage war on the flesh. We put our faith in Christ and you're a Christian, you're born again. Now you start to wage war on the flesh because your flesh has desires and passions. And how, one way we wage war on the flesh is this daily confession of our sins. Or another way to think about this between uh, rebirth confession and restoration for, uh, confession is Scripture makes it abundantly clear that each and every one of us has a court date. It's true. There's a God in heaven, and, and he's revealed himself to be a judge. And each of us, uh, when our time comes, when we die, when we encounter God, um, we will be held accountable for all of our actions, all of our thoughts, all of our words, all of our actions. That It's like we'll be sat in a, judge, uh, a, a courtroom, and God, the judge, is going to look at our lives and say, you know, at this age, you did this and this and this and this and this. And that. I demanded perfection. And yet you did these things. It'll be like a courtroom setting. But when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, when we're born again, the cross brings us out of the courtroom and into the family room of God. So that we no longer think of God or approach God as a judge, but now we approach God differently. We approach God as a father, as a loving father. And so... Legally, when you break a law, you are accountable uh, to the court system for that law, for, for, um, uh, to repay the wrong. That's a difference when a judge. But with a father, when you disobey a father, his love does not cease to exist on you or in you. And so when we're born again, when we pray this prayer of rebirth, we're brought into the family room where we approach God, our Father in heaven. We approach him, but yet we continue to grow. We continue to wage war on the flesh as we um, now have this daily fellowship with him. 
and, uh, and, and, and when we sin, we, we confess that sin, we, we, we restore the relationship with him. Um, okay, I kind of got myself lost there. First point, daily pursue the Father in forgiveness of him. Second point, daily confess our sins to him. Then the third point I want to look at is to extend that mercy to others. Is to extend that mercy to others. We said earlier that Jesus specifically used the word debtors in Matthew. The reason Jesus used the word debtors is he's going to revisit this scene again in Matthew 18 when he shares this parable. This parable says this, and this parable speaks life into the second clause as we forgive though as we forgive our debtors, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. In Matthew 18, Jesus shares this parable. He says this, that there is this king and this servant, and there is a slave to that servant, and the king went to settle his accounts. Now the servant owed the king a um, hundred or 10,000 bags of gold. That's the equivalent today of $10 billion. The servant owed the king. I don't know what he did, but he owed him a heck of a lot of money. $10 billion worth of, uh, of gold to the king. And so the king comes to him and he says, settle up. Uh, you owe me $10 billion, give it to me. And so um, the servant clearly can't pay back all this sum of money. And so he falls on his knees and he pleads for mercy. King, please don't throw me in prison. I promise I'll try and repay back. I'll do my best. And it says the king was moved with mercy, with pity. And tells the servant, uh, I'm canceling your debt. I'm going to cancel this debt. But then the story continues that this man who owed $10 billion, he goes to his servant. Now this servant owed him $10,000 worth. And he says, give me my $10,000. And the, the slave said, I, I, I can't pay it right now. Give me time. I promise I'll pay it back. And the servant said, absolutely not. He throws him in jail. And he forces his family, he inflicts this punishment that this $10,000, he will pay this back. Word was, came to the king. And it says that the king called the servant in and he said this. He said, you wicked servant, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, the king handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he paid back everything you owe. And then Jesus says this in verse 1835. He says, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The truth that Jesus is relaying, and the reason I want to uh, pause on this is when we pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We um, love to benefit from God's forgiveness to us. And yet forgiveness of others is hard. It's hard in the flesh. It's hard to wrap our minds around. It's hard to wrap our hearts around. But Jesus reveals this parable and he says this, God the Father through Jesus on the cross has canceled all your debt, all the sin you've committed against the Father. Now, who are you to hold these three, four, six sins against this person? Interestingly, I'm 29 years old. I've lived for 10,838 days on this earth. Let's just say generally speaking, liberally speaking, I sin five times a day. My thoughts, um, my words, the, 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 any kind of sin, the huge sins, the, the sin, the secret sins then we would say, in my lifetime, in my 29 years, I have sinned almost 54,000 times against God. And yet, I have the assurance of the cross to come to God and say, I cannot pay this back. Please have mercy on me. And the Father says, through Jesus, I will have mercy. I will cancel all that debt. Who am I? 54,000 sins. Who am I to turn to somebody else who's wronged me three times, or broke my stretch Armstrong ten times, and say, I ain't going to forgive you. And yet, look at the Father and say, 54,000 sins he's forgiven me. Who am I? The 
The Father tells us, Jesus tells us rather, to forgive us our debts. That because of Jesus lived and died and rose again, we can encounter, we can experience, we can have the forgiveness of our sins. And yet, encountering, receiving that forgiveness ignites us to new birth. And in this new birth, we recognize that, hey, now we can forgive others. Why? Because mercy has been shown to us. Encountering the Father's mercy through the cross enables us to extend mercy to others. And I say that very carefully because I know there are those of us this morning who are struggling through forgiveness, that have wrongs done to them way worse um, than a Stretch Armstrong being broken, that this very deep, dark pain um, through the situations that have been inflicted on you, and, and forgiveness may not come easy. But Jesus tells us, he encourages us, he commands us, but he also enables us to extend forgiveness to others. Why? Because God has extended mercy to us. Encountering the Father's mercy through the cross enables us to extend mercy to others. I just want to close with this <clears throat> illustration to kind of better encapsulate the idea. There's a, there's a Scottish pastor by the name of William Arnett. And William Arnett had a missionary in his congregation, and this missionary went to Burma. And he was crossing these rivers and these streams to get to this village in Burma where he was going to proclaim Jesus, uh, proclaim the gospel to these, to these crowds of people who have never heard of Jesus before. And the missionary noticed that <clears throat> this one particular time he was fording through a river. And he got across the other side and discovered that his body was now covered with these small leeches. I mean, he was covered from neck to foot in leeches, uh, just kind of busily sucking his blood. And so his first impulse was to start plucking these leeches off. And the servant, the, the Burmese translator that was with him, quickly um, stopped him and warned him, explaining that all you're doing by pulling these leeches off is you're leaving a part of the leech still in your skin. And uh, that's going to continue to fester. It's going to get infected. It's going to be made worse. And so the missionary, kind of freaking out, is like, okay, 